Hey, have you ever used Cheapo Air? For years, and I really like it. With Cheapo Air, you can book online, use their app, or even over the phone. They've got great prices on over 500 airlines and millions of accommodations. They're my go-to for travel planning. And if you join their Club Miles program, you can earn points to save on the cost of your travel. Book on the app, and you get double points. Sounds like it's time I tried Cheapo Air. Call Cheapo Air at 855-247-3279 or visit CheapoAir.com slash podcast. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt, felt I right. Really right. I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it out. It was that golden moment because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. New York City, we have an event August 24th at the Bowery Poetry Club. Go to storycollider.org for more info. This week's story is from Diana Reese. It was recorded in May 2015 at Littlefield in Brooklyn. For the past 30 years, I have been communicating... I've been in communication with non-terrestrials. It's true, and I'm confessing it here. Um, These non-terrestrials are often referred to as the greys. Have you guys heard about them, the greys? These are um, really large-brained creatures like us. They live in really highly social societies like we do. uh, the society is actually called a fission-fusion type society. It means they make close friends, they work with those colleagues, those allies, In they cooperate, they raise their young, they forage or find food together, much like we do. It sounds familiar. They're even so smart that they recognize themselves in mirrors. They're interested in looking at a mirror and watching themselves move and do different behaviors. I know this because I've been studying these non-terrestrials, again, for well over 30 years. And, um, well, I guess maybe some of you have guessed this. These are dolphins. They're actually bottlenose dolphins. And I've had the extraordinary uh, fortune to be able to study them uh, and their, their species in a variety of environments. I've worked in many aquariums. Right now I'm at the National Aquarium and I'm also working with them in the field uh, in Belize and Bimini in their, and watching these highly social, amazing big brains interact. And in the 30 years that I've been working with them, I've been exper- having lots of experiences and I'm absolutely convinced that they need global protection. And I've been working over the past couple of years to protect them. Um, many of you, how many of you have seen The Cove, the film The Cove? I was involved in that film getting made. Yeah, because we tried when, when this is a play, there's a place in Japan where these animals are herded into a small cove and they're killed in the most inhumane way. And I, I um, let me, I'm gonna come back to this, but they need global protection anyway. But tonight, I'm here to tell my story. I'm here to tell a very specific story. And this story is my first encounter with a cetacean kind. Okay. And I was a graduate student. I had gotten a grant from the French government. I did my PhD in this country at Temple University. But I was this sort of new graduate student. I was trying to understand the nature of the intelligence, the kind of communication that these incredible species use. And they are truly alien, if you think about it. Their bodies could not be more different than ours. Just morphologically, their body forms. They might as well be from another planet, but they do live in all the seas on our planet. Anyway, so I went off to France. I had this grant from the French government. I was very lucky. And I worked in a little marine zoo. And I was trying to develop underwater keyboards so we could communicate with dolphins. And actually, we've done some of that work over the years. Um, And they're doing things that, if I have time, I wish I could tell you the whole story. But I'm going to stick to my first encounter tonight. Anyway, I went to this little marine zoo. And I was working with this young dolphin named Circe. And Circe um, had been captured from the wild at about four years of age. And here I'm facing this four-year-old dolphin. And I can't help but say we should not be taking dolphins from the wild. This happened back in 1979 when people were still doing this kind of thing. We want to leave them in their societies. So I keep on 
plugging for this whenever I can. But I was working with this young dolphin, Circe, and dolphins in the wild have to capture food by chasing it down and, again, finding ways to capture their food. They often work collectively. Circe was in a pool, and I had to teach her to station. What this means is when I put a bucket of food on the side of the pool, she should stop and just stay with me while I give her fish. The fish I was asked to give her was about this big. And it was this Spanish mackerel. And I'm looking at the fish and I'm thinking, there's no way this, this dolphin is going to eat a fish this big. So I cut the fish into heads, middles, and tails. And Cersei readily ate the, the heads. She readily ate the middle sections. She spit out every tail I gave her. And they had these big fins on the tails. And I thought, well, maybe the fins are sharp and they're you know, they're cutting her throat or it's hard to go down. So I started cutting off all the fins and she readily ate the, the, she readily ate the tails as soon as I cut the fish properly. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, who, who's training who here? You know, she had, she had now shaped my behavior to cut the fish just the right way. And what I forgot to tell you is I was there to do my PhD thesis. I wanted to study the visual abilities of the dolphin. I wanted to look at how dolphins and we would communicate. Um, and ultimately, I was trying to develop this underwater uh, system of communication using an interactive keyboard. So, but the first step was to simply get her to be in front of me and stay with me and for me to feed her. So I've now learned to cut her fit pr fish properly, and she's smart, and she's right in front of me, and I'm feeding her. She's eating the heads, she's eating the middle, she's eating my properly cut tails now. And if she broke station, which means she departed that position before I gave her a signal to leave, I needed to tell her she had done the wrong thing. And we didn't share a communication code. I didn't know Dolphinese, and she didn't know English. So what I did is I used a technique that trainers would often use, and it's called a timeout. Many of you might use this with kids. If you want to give a child a little bit of time to think about what they've done, or we want to tell our dog or our cat, you know, you've done the wrong thing, we'll break the social interaction. So what I did, when, if Circe left station, without me giving her this terminate signal, I would back away from the pool about 10 to 15 feet, and I would just stand there vertically and wait. And she would just stand there and stare at me, and here we were, staring at each other, but it worked to correct her behavior. I was using this as a correction mechanism, and she quickly learned in a few times that she had done the wrong thing, and she learned to stay at station till I, you know, I gave her the signal to go. Anyway, so now it's a few weeks down the road and everything's fine. She's learned to station. And by one day, I happened to throw an uncut tail. I made a mistake. I gave her this tail. And she looks up at me and she kind of looks over and she spits the fish out and she makes a beeline and goes to the other side of the pool and takes a vertical position and is just staring at me. And... I'm glad you're getting this because to me, I thought, oh my God, could this, is this my imagination? Could she possibly be giving me a timeout? <laughs> and as a scientist, I, I was flabbergasted, amazed, astonished, but I couldn't write this up. I couldn't say, yes, she understood the signal and she did it back. So what I needed to do is I needed to take this anecdote and make it into an experiment. So now I waited for a few days, and I was really carefully cutting all her fish and giving her all the proper you know, tails cut exactly the right way, and she stayed with me. And then on purpose, a couple weeks later, I gave her an uncut tail, and boom, she goes right across the pool again and takes this vertical position and stares at me. And I did this three other times, and each time, and only on those occasions, did she do the timeout. Now, this was so incredible to me. I wrote it up as one of the chapters for my doctoral thesis. And it was, not, it was the unintended chapter. I had no idea about this because it was something that just happened. And it was really the chapter that this dolphin gave me. And I, and I think essentially this is the root of communication and how it develops, whether it's a human and a dolphin or a human and a human. We figure out what works. We don't necessarily know what it means when we say certain words, when we hear certain words, when we're little. We learn what it, we get for it. And here's this dolphin that's been separated from us for 95 million years of evolution. That's the last time we had a common ancestor. 
such a different body form. She was from the wild, and here I am, this human, trying to understand the intelligence of this dolphin, and there it was. She had been able to figure this out. And I still get chills when I think about this experience. Again, this was my first encounter with this beautiful mind. And in 30 years of working with these animals, I feel compelled and obsessed to protect them. These animals, these species need global protection. They are societies in the seas and we need to save them. Thanks. That was Diana Reese. Diana is a cognitive psychologist and a marine mammal scientist and is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Her research focuses on dolphin cognition, communication, comparative animal cognition, and the evolution of intelligence. Her book, The Dolphin in the Mirror, Exploring Dolphin Minds and Saving Dolphin Lives, was published in 2011. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Evelith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show and to Dolphins for saying such nice things about us, presumably. Thanks for listening. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. 